Part Three of Time Crime by H. Beam Piper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Time Crime, Part Three. They emerged into the interior of a long shed, adobe walled and thatch roofed, with small barred windows set high above the earth floor. It was cool and shadowy, and the air was heavy with the fragrance of citrus fruits. There were bins along the walls, some partly full of oranges and piles of wicker baskets. Another conveyor dome stood beside the one in which they had arrived. Two men in white cloaks and riding boots sat on the edge of one of the bins, smoking and talking. Scordan Curve introduced them, Gathon Dard and Crador Arv, special detectives, and asked if anything new had come up. Crador Arv shook his head. We still have about forty to go, he said. Nothing new in their stories, still the same two timelines. These people, Scored and Curve explained, were all peons on the estate of a Karanda noble just above the big bend of the Ganges. The Krautha hit their master's estate about ten days ago, elapsed time. In telling about their capture, most of them say that their master's wife killed herself with a dagger after the Krautha killed her husband, but about one out of ten say that she was kidnapped by the Krautha. Two different timelines, of course. The ones who tell the suicide story saw no firearms among the Krautha. The ones who tell the kidnapped story say that they all had the same kind of muskets and pistols. We're making synthetic summaries of the two stories. We're having trouble with the locals about all these strangers coming in, Gathon Dard added. They're getting curious. We'll have to take a chance on that, Val said. Are the interrogations still going on? Then let's have a look in at them. The big double doors at the end of the shed were barred on the inside. Crador Arv unlocked a small side door, letting Val, Dalla, and Gathon Dard out. In the yard outside, a gang of slaves were unloading a big wagon of oranges and packing them into hampers. They were guarded by a couple of native riflemen who seemed mostly concerned with keeping them away from the shed, and a man in a white cloak was watching the guards for the same purpose. He walked over and introduced himself to Vol. Golzan Doth, local alias Dosu Golan. I am Consolidated Outtime Foodstuffs manager here. Nasty business for you people, Vol sympathized. If it's any consolation, it's a bigger headache for us. Have you any idea what's going to be done about these slaves? Golzan Doth asked. I have to remember that the company has 40,000 paratemporal exchange units invested in them. The top office was very specific in requesting information about that. Vol shook his head. That's over my echelon, he said. Have to be decided by the Paratime Commission. I doubt if your company will suffer. You bought them innocently, in conformity with local custom. Ever buy slaves from this Koru Hin Irigod before? I'm new here. The man I'm replacing broke his neck when his horse put a foot in a gopher hole about two ten days ago. Beside him, Val could see Dalla nod as though making a mental note. When she got back to home timeline, she put a crew of mediums to work trying to contact the discarnate former plantation manager. At Rogam Institute, she had been working on the problem of return of a discarnate personality from out time. A few times, Scordon Curve said. Nothing suspicious, all local stuff. We questioned Koru Hin Irigod pretty closely on that point, and he says that this is the first time he ever brought a batch of Nebu Hin Abenaz's outlanders this far west. The interrogations were being conducted inside the plantation house, in the secret central rooms where the paratimers lived. Scordran Curve used a door activator to slide open a hidden door. I suppose I don't have to warn either of you that any positive statement made in the hearing of a narco-hypnotized subject, he began, has the effect of hypnotic suggestion, Vol picked up after him, and should be avoided unless such suggestion is intended, Dalla finished. 
Scordran Curve laughed, opening another inner door, and stood aside. In what had been the paratimer's recreation room, most of the furniture had been shoved into the corners. Four small tables had been set up, widely spaced and with screens between. Across each of them, with an electric recorder between, an almost naked Karanda slave faced a paratime police psychist. At a long table at the far side of the room, four men and two girls were working over stacks of cards and two big charts. Frakor Voln, the man who was working on the charts, introduced himself. Synthesist. He introduced the others. Vol made a point of the fact that Dalla was his wife, in case any of the cops began to get ideas, and mentioned that he spoke Karanda, had spent some time on the fourth-level Kolgor, and was a qualified psychist. "'What have you got so far?' he asked. Two different timelines and two different gangs of wizard traders, Frakor Voln said. We've established the latter from physical descriptions and because both batches were sold by the Krautha at equivalent periods of elapsed time. Vol picked up one of the kidnap story cards and glanced at it. I notice there's a fair verbal description of these firearms and mention of electric whips, he said. I'm curious about where they came from. Well, this is how we reconstructed them, Chief's assistant, one of the girls said, handing him a couple of sheets of white drawing paper. The sketches have been done with soft pencil. They bore repeated erasures and corrections. That of the whip showed a cylindrical handle, indicated as twelve inches in length and one in diameter, fitted with a thumb switch. That's definitely second-level Kifton. Vol said, handing it back. Made of braided copper or silver wire and powered with a little nuclear conversion battery in the grip. They heat up to about two hundred centigrade. Produce really painful burns. Why, that's beastly! Dalla exclaimed. Anything on the Kifton sector is. Scordren Curve looked at the four slaves at the tables. We don't have a really bad case here now. A few of these people were lash-burned horribly, though. Val was looking at the other sketches. One was a musket, with a wide butt and a band-fastened stock. The lock mechanism, vaguely flintlock, had been dotted intentatively. The other was a long pistol, similarly definite in outline and vague in mechanical detail. It was merely a knob-butted miniature of the musket. I've seen firearms like these, have a lot of them in my collection, he said, handing back the sketches. Low-order mechanical or high-order pre-mechanical cultures. Fact is, things like these could have been made on the Kolgor sector if the Karandas had learned to combine sulfur, carbon, and nitrates to make powder. The interrogator at one of the tables had evidently heard all his subject could tell him. He rose, motioning the slave to stand. Now go with that man, he said in Karanda, motioning to one of the detectives in native guard uniform. You will trust him. He is your friend and will not harm you. When you have left this room, you will forget everything that has happened here, except that you were kindly treated and that you were given wine to drink and your hurts were anointed. You will tell the others that we are their friends and they have nothing to fear from us. You will not try to remove the mark from the back of your left hand. As the detective led the slave out a door at the other side of the room, the psychist came over to the long table, handing over a card and lighting a cigarette. Suicide story, he said to one of the girls who took the card. Anything new? Some minor details about the sale to the Caleras on this timeline. I think we've about scraped bottom. You can't say that, Frakor Voln objected. The very last one may give us something nobody else had noticed. Another subject was sent out. The interrogator came over to the table. One of the kidnap story crowd, he said. This one was right beside that Krautha who took the shot at the wild pig, or whatever it was on the way to the wizard trader's camp. 
Best description of the guns we've gotten so far. No question that they're flintlocks. He saw Verkan Vall. Oh, hello, Assistant Verkan. What do you make of them? You're an authority on outtime weapons, I understand. I'd have to see them. These people simply don't think mechanically enough to give a good description. A lot of peoples make flintlock firearms. He started running over, in his mind, the paratemporal areas in which gunpowder, but not the percussion cap, was known. Expanding cultures, which had progressed as far as the former, but not the latter. Static cultures, in which an accidental discovery of gunpowder had never been followed up by further research. post tobacco cultures, in which a few stray bits of ancient knowledge had survived. Another interrogator came over, and then the fourth. For a while they sat and talked and drank coffee, and then the next quartet of slaves, two men and two women, were brought in. One of the women had been badly blistered by the electric whips of the wizard traders. In spite of reassurances, all were visibly apprehensive. "'We will not harm you,' one of the psychists told them. "'Here, here is medicine for your hurts. At first it will sting, as good medicines will, but soon it will take away all pain. And here is wine for you to drink.' A couple of detectives approached, making a great show of pouring wine and applying ointment. Under cover of the medication they jabbed each slave with a hypodermic needle, and then guided them to seats at the four tables. Val and Dalla went over and stood behind one of the psychists, who had a small flashlight in his hand. "'Now, rest for a while,' the psychist was saying. "'Rest and let the good medicine do its work.' You are tired and sleepy. Look at this magic light, which brings comfort to the troubled. Look at the light. Look at the light. They move to the next table. Did you have a hand in the fighting? No, Lord. We are peasant folk, not fighting people. We had no weapons, nor weapon skill. Those who fought were all killed. We held up empty hands and were spared to be captives of the Krautha. What happened to your master, the Lord Gromdur, and to his lady? One of the Krautha threw a hatchet and killed our master, and then his lady threw a dagger and killed herself. The psychist made a red mark on the card in front of him and circled the number on the back of the slave's hand with a red indelible crayon. Val and Dalla went to the third table. They had the common weapons of the Krautha lord, and they also had the weapons of the wizard traders. Of these they carried the long weapons slung across their backs, and the short weapons thrust through their belts. A blue mark on the card, a blue circle on the back of the slave's hand. They listened to both versions of what had happened at the sack of the Lord Gromdor's estate, and the march into the captured city of Jirda and the second march into the forest to the camp of the wizard traders. The servants of the wizard traders did not appear until after the Krautha had gone away. They wore different garb. They wore short jackets and trousers, and short boots, and they carried small weapons on their belts. They had whips of great cruelty that burned like fire. We were all lashed with these whips, as you may see, Lord. The Krautha had bound us two and two, with neck yokes. These the servants of the wizard traders took off from us, and they chained us together by tens, with the chains we still wore when we came to this place. They killed my child, my little Zuza, the woman with the horribly blistered back was wailing. They tore her out of my arms, and one of the servants of the wizard traders, may Kokat devour his soul forever, dashed out her brains and when I struggled to save her, I was thrown to the ground and beaten with the fire whips until I fainted. Then I was dragged into the forest along with the others who were chained with me. She buried her head in her arms, sobbing bitterly. Dalla stepped forward, taking the flashlight from the interrogator with one hand and lifting the woman's head with the other. She flashed the light quickly in the woman's eyes. 
You will grieve no more for your child, she said. Already you are forgetting what happened at the wizard trader's camp, and remembering only that your child is safe from harm. Soon you will remember her only as a dream of the child you hope to have some day. She flashed the light again, then handed it back to the psychist. Now tell us what happened when you were taken into the forest. What did you see there? The psychist nodded approvingly, made a note on the card, and listened while the woman spoke. She had stopped sobbing now, and her voice was clear and cheerful. Val went over to the long table. Those slaves were still chained with the wizard trader's chains when they were delivered here. Where are the chains? he asked Scordren Curve. In the permanent conveyor room, Scordren Curve said. You can look at them there. We didn't want to bring them in here, for fear these poor devils would think we were going to chain them again. They're very light, very strong, some kind of alloy steel. Files and power saws only polish them. It takes fifteen seconds to cut a link with an atomic torch. One long chain and short lengths, fifteen inches long, staggered every three feet with a single hinge shackle for the ankle. The shackles were riveted with soft wrought-iron rivets, evidently made with some sort of a power riveting machine. We cut them easily with a cold chisel. They ought to be sent to Durgabar equivalent police terminal for study of material and workmanship. Now, you mentioned some scheme you had for capturing this conveyor that brings in the slaves for Nebu Hinabanaz. What have you in mind? We still have Koru Hin Irigod and all his gang under hypno. I thought of giving them hypnotic conditioning and sending them back to Kariba with orders to put out some kind of signal the next time Nebu Hin Ebenaz starts out on a buying trip. We could have a couple of men posted in the hills overlooking Kariba, and they could send a message ball through to police terminal. Then a party could be sent with a mobile conveyor to ambush Nebu Hin Ebenaz on the way and wipe out his party. Our people could take their horses and clothing and go on to take the conveyor by surprise. I'd suggest one change. Instead of relying on visual signals by the hypno-conditioned Koru Hin Irigod, send a couple of our men to Kariba with midget radios. Skordran Curve nodded. Sure, we can condition Koru Hin Irigod to accept them as friends and vouch for them at Kariba. Our boys can be traders and slave buyers. Kariba's a market town. Traders are always welcome. They can have firearms to sell, revolvers and repeating rifles. Any collateral buy any firearm that's better than the one he's carrying. They'll always buy revolvers and repeaters. We can get what we want from Commercial 407. We can get riding and pack horses here. Val nodded. And the post overlooking or in radio range of Kariba on this timeline. And another on Paul term. For the ambush of Nebu Hin Abenaz's gang and the capture of the conveyor, use anything you want to. Sleep gas, paralyzers, energy weapons, anti-grav equipment, anything. As far as regulations about using only equipment appropriate to local culture levels, forget them entirely. But take that conveyor intact. You can locate the base timeline from the settings of the instrument panel, and that's what we want most of all. Dalla and the police psychist, having finished with and dismissed their subject, came over to the long table. That poor creature, Dalla was saying. What sort of fiends are they? If that made you sick, remember, we've been listening to things like that for the last eight hours. Some of the stories were even worse than that one. Well, I'd like to use a heat gun on the whole lot of them, turn down to where it'd just fry them medium rare. Dalla said. And for whoever's back of this, take him to second-level Kifton and sell him to the priests of Fasif. Too bad you're not coming back from your vacation instead of starting out, Chief's Assistant Verkan, Skordren Curve said. This is too big for me to handle alone, and I'd sooner work under you than anybody else Chief Tortha sends in. Val, 
Dalla cried in indignation. You're not going to just report on this and then walk away from it, are you? But darling, Val replied, in what he hoped was a convincing show of surprise, you don't want our vacation postponed again, do you? If I get mixed up in this, there's no telling when I can get away, and by the time I'm free, something may come up at Rogam Institute that you won't want to drop. Val, you know perfectly well that I wouldn't be happy for an instant on the Dwarma sector thinking about this. All right, then. Let's forget about the vacation. You want to stay on for a while and help me with this? It'll be a lot of hard work, but we'll be together. Yes, of course. I want to do something to smash those devils. Val, if you'd heard some of the things they did to those poor people... Well, I'll have to go back to Palterm as soon as I'm reasonably well filled in on this and report to Tortha Karf and tell him I've taken charge. You can stay here and help with these interrogations. I'll be back in about ten hours. Then we can go to Colgore East India Sec Reg HQ to talk to Ranthar Jard. We may be able to get something that'll help us on that end. You may be able to have your vacation before too long, Dr. Hadron. Scordron Curve told her. Once we capture one of their conveyors, the instrument panel will tell us what timeline they're working from, and then we'll have them. There's an indo turanian sector parable about a snake charmer who thought he was picking up his snake and found that he had hold of an elephant's tail, Val said. That might be a good thing to bear in mind till we find out just what we have picked up. Coming down a hallway on the hundred and seventh floor of the management wing of the Paratime Building, Yandar Yad paused to admire, in the green mirror of the glassoid wall, the jaunty angle of his silver feathered cap, the fit of his short jacket, and the way his weapon hung at his side. This last was not instantly recognizable as a weapon. It looked more like a portable radio, which indeed it was. It was, nonetheless, a potent weapon. One flick of his finger could connect that radio with one at Triplanet News Service, and within the hour anything he said into it would be heard by all Terra, Mars, and Venus. In consequence, there existed around the Paratime Building a marked and understandable reluctance to antagonize Yandar Yad. He glanced at his watch. It was twenty minutes short of one thousand, when he had an appointment with Baltan Vrath, the Comptroller General. Glancing about, he saw that he was directly in front of the doorway of the Outtime Claims Bureau, and he strolled in, walking through the waiting room and into the claims presentation office. At once, he stiffened like a bird dog at point. Sfabron Larv, one of his young legmen, was in altercation across the counter desk with Varkar Klav, the deputy claims agent on duty at the time. Varkar was trying to be icily dignified. Sfabron Larv's black hair was in disarray and his face was suffused with anger. He was pounding with his fist on the plastic countertop. "'You have to!' he was yelling in the older man's face. "'That's a public document, and I have a right to see it. You want me to go into Tribune's court and get an order? If I do, there'll be a question in council about why I had to before the day's out.' "'What's the matter, Larv?' Yandor Yad asked lazily. He tried to hold something out on you? Sfabron Larv turned. His eyes lit happily when he saw his boss, and then his anger returned. I want to see a copy of an indemnity claim that was filed this morning, he said. Varkar here won't show it to me. What does he think this is? A fourth-level dictatorship? What kind of a claim now? Yandar Yad addressed Larv, ignoring Varkar Klav. Consolidated Outtime Foodstuffs. One of the Thalvan Interests companies. Just claimed 40,000 PEU for a hundred slaves bought by one of their plantation managers on third-level Eseron from a local slave dealer. The Paratime Police impounded the slaves for narco-hypnotic interrogation and then transposed a lot of them to police terminal. Yandar Yad still held his affection of sleepy indolence. Now, 
Why would the paracops do that, I wonder? Slavery's an established local practice on Esseron Sector. Our people have to buy slaves if they want to run a plantation. I know that, Svabron Larv replied. That's what I want to find out. There must be something wrong, either with the slaves, or the treatment our people were giving them, or the Paratime Police, and I want to find out which. To tell the truth, Larv, so do I, Yandar Yad said. He turned to the man behind the counter. Varkar, do we see that claim, or do I make a story out of your refusal to show it? he asked. The Paratime Police asked me to keep this confidential, Varkar Klav said. Publicity would seriously hamper an important police investigation. Yandar Yad made an impolite noise. How do I know that all it would do would be to reveal police incompetence? He retorted. Look, Varkar, you and the Paratime Police and the Paratime Commission and the Home Timeline Management are all hired employees of the Home Timeline Public. The public has a right to know what its employees are doing, and it's my business to see that they're informed. Now, for the last time, will you show us a copy of that claim? Well, let me explain off the record, the official begged. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I had that off-the-record gag worked on me when I was about Larve's age, fifty years ago. Anything I get, I put on the air or not at my own discretion. All right, Varkar Klav surrendered, pointing to a reading screen and twiddling a knob. But when you read it, I hope you have enough discretion to keep quiet about it. The screen lit, and Yandar Yad automatically pressed a button for a photocopy. The two newsmen stared for a moment, and then even Yandar Yad's shell of drowsy negligence cracked and fell from him. His hand brushed the switch as he snatched the handphone from his belt. Marva, he barked, before the girl at the news office could more than acknowledge. Get this recorded for immediate telecast. Ready? Beginning. The existence of a huge paratemporal slave trade came to light on the afternoon of 159 Day on a timeline of the third-level Esseron sector, when field agent Scordran Curve, Paratime Police, discovered at an orange plantation of the consolidated outtime foodstuffs. End of Part 3